All right, so where I left off the last video, I was telling you about the tensiometer as a way of measuring water content. But one of the cool things about the tensiometer is it's not trying to measure water content uh, as much as it is directly trying to measure matrix potential. So that brings us back to the sometimes confusing world of potential, where we last were when we were talking about plant water potential. So before we dive into the details of how we figure out soil water potential and how we use it to tell us which way the water is moving, I wanted to step back for a minute and carefully define potential. So potential is free energy and free energy is energy that can be converted to do work. So soil water potential then is telling us about the energy available in the soil water that can do work of moving that water from one place to another. So work then is always force times distance. Therefore potential is force times distance. So force is a mass times an acceleration. And in this case, our acceleration is gonna be gravity and our distance is gonna be a length. If we're talking about water, then we can take mass and we can make it the density of water times the volume of water. And then we still have our gravity and our length. And this is gonna give us uh, units in the SI system of Newton meters. But sometimes uh, we don't talk about potential that way we normalize it or we divide it by something. So sometimes we talk about potential per unit weight of the water uh, and that gives us units of meters uh, or this will be familiar to those of you who have taken hydrogeology because this is units of head. So really in hydrogeology where you were talking about head, you were talking about potential, all right? Uh, so this is thinking about the equivalent height of the water. We can also measure potential per unit volume, all right? And that will give us pressure units. So this is frequently used in the plant water potential and soil water worlds because we can actually define some things uh, in terms of potential. So remember we talked about field capacity. So that is all the water that can be stored in a soil and not drain vertically due to gravity. Well, that is often defined as occurring at negative 33 kilopascals, right? And the wilting point, the point at which plants can no longer suck water out of the soil, is negative 1500 kilopascals. In other words, the uh, force with which plants can take up water is less than 1500 kilopascals. So if we get to a potential that is smaller than negative 1500 kilopascals, the plants can't counter that and they can't get it out of the soil. Okay. So again, you saw an equation like this when we were talking about plant water potential. So potential psi, so we have psi s is the total soil water potential. And now we're gonna break down each of these terms, which actually you have seen before when we did this for plants. So psi sub m is the matrix potential. Again, this is our tension or our suction forces. So the matrix potential is important when the soils are below field capacity. So when all of the water is being held in place by capillary and adhesive forces. So when the water content is less than field capacity, the matrix potential is gonna be negative. When the water content is at or above field capacity, the matrix potential or the tension that's holding that water in place is gonna be zero. The gravitational potential, so again, for our hydrogeologists in the group, this will be familiar because it's elevation head. So this is what sort of gravity drainage we will get if gravity is just free to act on uh, any of the water that's not held in place by capillary and adhesive forces. So this is important when we have uh, water contents that are someplace between field capacity and saturation. 
The third main potential we're going to think about in soils is the pressure potential, and this is really only important in saturated conditions, and this hydrogeologist is equivalent to our pressure head. So if we have to review, if we are in less than field capacity conditions, we're going to mostly be concerned about matrix potential. If we're between field capacity and saturation, we're going to be mostly concerned about gravitational potential. And if we are at saturated conditions, now we're in the realm of hydrogeology and we're gonna care about pressure potential and gravitational potential. So if we measure all three of these things, we can uh, tell ourselves, we can get information about what range of conditions the soil is in uh, and go from there. There are two other terms in that uh, equation and in most cases these are going to be small potatoes compared to the rest but psi o is the osmotic or solute potential now you can imagine some places where this is important this might be important if you have um, some salinization happening in your soil moisture or groundwater uh, and t is thermal potential so just as touching Back to plants, um, osmotic or solute potential was really important in plants. And thermal potential is that one that we keep sort of writing into the equation and then crossing off in almost every case. Okay, so we've got our equation. And you should remember from talking about plants or from taking hydrogeology that water is going to fly, flow from areas of high potential to areas of low potential. And in, in soils, this is going to be from areas that have a high water content to areas that have a low water content. Now, when I say it flows, that doesn't necessarily mean it does it completely of its own volition just under the influence of gravity. Because remember, gravity is only going to be at play if we are in excess of field capacity. But in this case, we have wet soils down here, and we have drier soils up here. So we have high potential and high water content down here, and low potential and low water content here. So water should be moving from this wet area uh, up to and through this drier area. So this is what the situation we find ourselves in when we are evaporating water. So our near surface uh, water content has been decreased by evaporation. So that decreases the water potential up here. Down here, there's still plenty of water available. So we've set up a potential gradient and water that is being evaporated from here and out is going to tend to be pulled from this high potential area down at the base of the soils into the lower potential area and then ultimately into the atmosphere. Of course, if you remember from evaporation, um, as the soil dries out, more energy is necessary to move that water um, because there's a lot more resistance in the, in the equation uh, when we're trying to move through air-filled pores in that evaporation process and, and a, a longer distance of air-filled pores. All right, we could flip our diagram on its head. So during and following rainfall, water is being added to the surface of the soil, right? And so we get a high water content and a high potential up here. And that is going to bring water uh, down to the lower parts of the soil because they have a low water content and a low potential. So again, gravity is gonna be part of this. In this case, it looks like the surface of the soil is saturated. So we have to think about some gravitational head and maybe some pressure head. Um, but down here, we have only matrix potential to think about because I'm uh, just going to guess that this is under field capacity. And remember, matrix potential is going to be negative because it's a suction. And so we have positive gravitational potential and pressure potential up here and negative potential down here. So water is going to move from the high potential area to the low potential area. And that right there is the basis for infiltration.
But before we dive into exactly how infiltration works, which is what we'll talk about on Thursday when I'm back in class, uh, let's spend some more time thinking about uh, what we can tell from these potential measurements about what's happening in the soil. So this is a diagram from your book. Uh, what we've got going on over here is a manometer. So that's measuring the pressure. Um, and it's supposed to be measuring the, uh, the pressure right here in the soil. And I said pressure. Remember, we're talking about potential in pressure units. So if we have, um, and, and this right here is a well. And that well is saying that the water table is right here in this block of soil where the um, manometer happens to be measuring. So we are sitting right at the water table. So our matrix potential at the water table is zero. And our pressure potential at the water table is zero because there's no weight of the overlying water. Uh, so the only potential we would have to think about here is the elevation potential, so psi g. And that is just going to be dependent on the elevation that our manometer is at. If we take a moist soil, so notice it says moist and not saturated. If we take a fairly wet soil, uh, now we have a matrix potential. And again, it's negative. Um, and oh, notice the units here of centimeters. That means we're going to be expressing it in terms of head. So it's still a potential, but we're just using head units here. So it's negative 400 centimeters. Because there's no weight of overlying saturated water, our pressure potential is going to be zero. And again, our gravitational potential is just going to reflect the elevation. If we dry that soil out, our pressure potential stays negative. Um, but now our matrix potential, or the suction, gets really small, negative 5,000 centimeters. All right. So in this scenario, our saturated soil has the highest potential at zero. Our moist soil has a slightly lower potential, negative 400 centimeters. And our dry soil has the lowest potential at negative 5,000 centimeters. All right, so here's my version of that. So we've got a soil profile, and we've got potential measurements of three different depths in the soil profile. All right, A, B, and C. And here's the data. So this is, and again, I'm going to use head units. So this is the matrix head, the gravitational head, and the pressure head. So at A, we have a matrix head of negative 400 centimeters a gravitational head of 300 centimeters, and a pressure head of zero. If we're over here at B, we see a little bit of a less negative matrix head. It's at a lower elevation, so that uh, head has gone down as well, and it's still at zero. If we get down to the bottom of this soil profile, our matrix head is zero, our elevation head has gotten a little lower and our pressure head has gotten a little higher. So the first question I want you to think about here is based on this data, which locations are unsaturated? The key thing to look at if we're thinking about identifying saturated versus unsaturated conditions is whether we have a pressure head. And at C, we have a positive pressure head. So we know that C is saturated. At A and B, we have no pressure head. So now we're unsaturated, um, or we're sitting right at the water table. But we know we're not sitting right at the water table because we have these negative matrix heads here at A and B. All right, And if we were sitting right at the water table, they'd be 0. So my answer to this first question is that A and B are unsaturated. Which location is saturated? Oh, I already answered that. It's the one with the positive pressure head and a zero matrix head. All right, so the next question is, which way is the moisture moving? 
In order to answer that, we need to know about the total head or total potential in each of these locations. And we can do that by adding up the numbers of the different head components. All right. So at A, we have negative 400 plus 300 is negative 100 centimeters. At B, we have negative 150 plus 200. That's a positive 50 centimeters. And at C, we have 100 plus 50. So our total head is 150 centimeters. So our uh, water is always going to flow from high head to low head, which means it's going to flow from C to A. And C to A means it's going up, right? So which way is the moisture moving? It's moving up. All right. That's fairly simple math, hopefully. So now let's bring it back to hydrology. What process is driving the moisture movement? What brings water vertically up in a soil profile? You should be thinking to yourself, evaporation or evapotranspiration. All right. So that's an example of how we can use soil water potential data to answer some pretty basic questions about what's going on hydrologically within a soil profile. So what I want to leave you with today is a different set of data, same cartoon, but the numbers in the table have changed. And I want you to be able to answer the questions about which locations are unsaturated, which are saturated, which way the moisture is going, and what's driving the moisture movement. So work this answer out on a sheet of paper and then head to the practice at home uh, folder within Blackboard and you will be able to check your work. And I will see you on Thursday where we'll take these ideas of potential gradients and soil moisture and we will integrate them to understand the process of infiltration.